Good afternoon, everyone. I am the chair for this session. Um, grassroots approaches to local government elections. And we have five speakers in the session. Uh, and we'll begin with our first speaker, uh, uh, Sharp, uh, Stephen Murray. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. It's really been fantastic being part of this Left Dialogue Forum group. Thanks, Vish, for inviting me. Um, I was asked to give, an, give Sharp's approach to the local government elections. So I thought I should just uh, give a very brief introduction to what Sharp is, where it comes from, why we exist. Um, you know, okay, so the idea of Sharp um, arose in the run-up to the 2016 local government elections uh, when I finally conceded that I just didn't have a political home anymore. Uh, and not just a party that I could go out and vote for, but one that I could actually be an active participant in, be involved in branch activities, go out there and canvas and support for the party. Um, very much like in, in 1994, which I feel was the last time when I felt I had a political home. Um, I then, after 96, I spent the next 20 years I'm not involved in any kind of political work at all. I tried to learn how to grow vegetables organically on a larger scale. Um, but by 2016, I really started feeling a need to become more active in politics again. Um, so in the run-up to the 2019 elections, just over two years ago, I put this idea of Sharp out there on as a Facebook group. It was a bit tongue-in-cheek, uh, basically saying, you know, I don't have a party to vote for. None of the parties are taking climate change seriously or really addressing the systemic issues in our country. So here yeah, I'm sucking a new party out of the ice of blue, and here it is. And I was quite uh, surprised by the kind of enthusiasm and response uh, people wanted there and then to meet and form a new party and take part in the election which is only like four weeks away <laughs> it was totally crazy but anyway uh so why shop um for me it was trying to find a word that can resonate with lots of people lots of people use the word sharp people say sharp sharp how's it sharp you know uh, to be sharp means to be savvy, smart, good judgment. It's potentially quite catchy. And uh, we do have a lot of very sharp people in our country. And it's also not an abbreviation or an acronym. It doesn't stand for anything else. It just is what it is. So, did I skip one, sorry. So, yeah. We now have a, a quite an active Facebook group. I, I hardly even post to it anymore. There are people posting on it every day. Um, almost 1,500 people. There are quite a diverse range of people. Um, Chris Rutledge from Akua posts there sometimes. We have people from Adiba Crisis Committee in the group, like Sine Gugu Okuru and Non Shembu Toba and people like that. So it's quite a diverse group. And it's for me, it's encouraging, you know, that at least uh, there's that feeling that people want to somehow be involved, be active. I'm very much aware of the fact that I'm an old white man, I'm part of a sinking middle class because I'm self-employed. Um, so really what we, what we define ourselves now after two years of discussion and deliberation is a, as an activist collective and that we, in our own way, we're trying to mobilize and organize for the formation of a new political party. It brings together red and green politics under the banner of eco-socialism. I think if the climate justice charter movement now was where it was two years ago, I wouldn't have gone out and tried to set up this silly little thing called shop. Anyway, we are there now. And then, yeah, why on earth would we want to do such a thing? A number of South Africans concerned by increasing economic inequality, social injustice, environmental degradation, and climate change is rising. And many thousands of people have expressed the desire for a new political home, and that millions more are disillusioned with the electoral system and with the current party political options. I won't, I won't really go through all of this very much, um, but just that, uh, 
it's, for me, it's been like almost like testing the waters. And I'm amazed by how many people want to voluntarily give of their time, give of their skills, give of their expertise. Um, there's a chap I've never met before in real life, Dinesh Kukusame, who set up a, a wiki website for us, which is quite nice technology. It's a, I think it's something that the broad left could use because it's, it's a, like a website, but it's, it works more like Wikipedia works, where everybody who joins can go and contribute. You can add, you can edit, you can have conversations about stuff. And I do think it's uh, software that we, we should look into slightly more seriously. It could be a very useful thing. So it's not like a top-down thing where a group of people decide this is how the website must be, something that can grow organically with the changing circumstances. And yeah, we have sparked the imagination of some younger people, people like Raiz Anwar Mohammed, who's expressed an interest in what we're doing, uh, like Mitchell Black. Uh, and we've got a people spread out all over the country. A few of us are Joburg based, a couple Pretoria, Durban, Meritsburg. Uh, so let me just go through it, yeah. <clears throat> that was the, the idea. What One of the criticisms has been that, you know, okay, you're gonna form a new party, you're gonna go to parliament just to chow money. So one of the things we came up with was that in, in the eventuality of having a party, if one insisted that the representatives that get sent there don't take home more than 10 times the minimum wage, that you're demonstrating that you're not there to just charm money, but there to put, put across an alternative um, possibilities. Uh, okay, so back to reality. Uh, what we've done now, we've got about between 12 and 18 of us who are quite active, we meet quite regularly. We use not Zoom, but something called Chipsy Meet, which is open source. And we also uh, don't use WhatsApp, we're using Signal now, which is also uh, an open source thing. So we're trying to uh, walk the talk in a way. And we've set up smaller working groups now, and one of the smaller groups we've set up is to look at the upcoming local government elections. And uh, some of us at least now feel that it's worth at least pursuing that possibility, maybe in some areas, you know. Uh, if you, advantages of standing as a party is that you then have access to the PR votes. And if you look at the city of Johannesburg, uh, metropol metropolitan municipality the EFF didn't won one single law uh, it was only DA and uh, ANC candidates to won wars but yet they, they play quite a significant role uh, you know uh, they, they, they can have an effect I'm not quite articulating myself well now and unlike national elections or local government elections in a metropolitan municipality, it costs 3,500 rand. And you're covering all the water and proportional representation elections in that metropolitan council. And we've got 135 wards, I think there are. An average of about 16,000 uh, registered voters in each of those wards. Um, probably our turnout hasn't been more than about 50%, so maybe about 80 people in each ward is going to vote. I mean, there are, there are possibilities if one targeted uh, specific wards and could get a message out there. It is possible, I, I think, that one could get some kind of a representation from a left uh, eco-socialist kind of perspective. Um, this is Russian, this year. Yeah, and to register to contest for municipality, that's quite a straightforward way. You only need actually 100 people to sign the, sign the founding uh, deeds of it. Unlike for national, you need 500 people. And to register with the IAC, it costs you 200 rand. Small change. And then we've also discussed, you know, what, what kind of possibilities there are. And one would obviously be where there are civic organizations. Um, 
that are looking at that to see ways in which one could support that. And then, but we're also seriously uh, looking at the possibility of, say, registering a local party just to get our hands dirty. Uh, <coughs> we really got nothing to lose about that uh, by doing such a thing. I know, I know Vish has always cautioned me to say one needs to be careful setting up a, a left party is a really serious undertaking. It's not something one just does in a flippant way, which I tend to be. I'm a bit of an anarchist, I suppose. Um, let me just run through that. So for us, basically, there's a lot, been a lot of homework that we're having to do. And we've done a little bit of it so far. Like, what do ward councillors and PR councillors earn in a month, you know? I, I've heard that somewhere in the region of about 50 grand. So one can get a couple of PR and ward councillors in, and people take home 35 grand, which is 10 times the minimum. You getting, you can have 150,000 rand a month to spend on community food sovereignty projects. You know, That's, so kind of using the system against itself. Uh, but we really need to find out more about what councillors actually do, what their job descriptions are. Is there, is there an induction process for them? Do they go through any kind of training? So, so lots of lots of things. And one thing we also thought was to try and find out are there examples of good ward councillors anywhere in the country? And to try and draw lessons from them, get them to come and have discussions so that one can try and form some kind of a model or, uh, with, with positive possibilities. Um, so let me just see there. We also started doing something called a Sunday evening fireside. We've had two so far. Uh, very small groups of us, but we had Janet Love from the IAC and we had um, Ibrahim, what's his name again? Fakir at our last fireside where we looked at the whole the local government elections thing. So that's something we would like to develop and hopefully some of you would also like to be just a, for a Sunday evening, six to seven, uh, once or twice a month. Um, yeah, look at the outcomes of the 2016 local government elections. If you take the total voting population into account, you can see that like 32% of uh, the population were registered, but they just simply stayed away from the from the polls, you know, so um, less people participated than actually participated in the local government elections. And if you compare that to the 2014, also quite significant, but you can see how the ANC lost, you know. Uh, this, is quite, this is very much average, it's not totally accurate, but it gives you a good picture there. Uh, okay, shut up, I'm really there. So you can see how maybe your and Ronnie's CDQA campaign had its effect. About 3 million traditional ANC uh, voters simply stayed away in 2016. So what's going to happen this year? Let me just see here. Okay. And one of, the, one of the things we said that we were going to have to really do is something like a listening campaign. So it was lovely to hear Mario and other people were so talking about the door-to-door -door thing, you know. I'm going out there not to proselytize or preach or say to people, we've got the answers, but to hear from people, what are your problems, what are your challenges, what sort of services do you need, what are your frustrations? And then from there, try and use that as a, as a, as a manifesto or a, a platform. Um, yeah, that's it. And then because why? Because we can be able to as we like to say in South Africa. I really think I want to get my hands dirty, you know. Uh, if there's a kind of a broader grouping or serious about uh, registering for these upcoming elections, um, I think we would really much throw our weight into that, the little weight that we have. But time isn't on our side. And I, I just don't know when those elections happen and I go into that booth there and I see the choices there, you know, yes, it's, it's been, it's been really difficult for the last few elections for a lot of us, I think. Okay, and then just a little background about myself, I'm not going to go into that now, but for those who want to know where I'm coming from, uh, 
maybe what I, all I'll say is that um, I was spent four years in a very confined space with Comrade Karl Niehaus. <laughs> it was very difficult. And uh, I cringe every time I see him and I want to give him one more surprise. <laughs> what we're actually thinking of doing is some of us who were in prison with him is to organize a get together and make sure he's there and we're all gonna give him a good. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we just want to see that Tulani is here. Uh, Tulani uh, will be our next speaker from the Queenstown Civic. Tulani, you can begin with. Hi, your... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Hello, uh, yes, it's Tulani Bukan here. Uh, I'm with the chairperson of the ICORA as well with me, uh, but we blocked uh, on the same uh, device on my phone. So uh, we are based in Komani, Queenstown. Uh, the, the, the name of our civic organization is ICORA, Independent Komani Residents Association. It was started on the on the year 2017. Uh, it's a where it's a, where we are situated. We are a, a, a community of about five wards. And then that's where the the, the civic organization was started uh, because of the lack of service delivery to the people and the corruption that is is increasing every day and a maladministration in our municipality, that is Enoch in Kijima. Uh, so people came up with the idea that we need to mobilize uh, one another so that we, 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 we become one mass movement that is able to challenge the, the, the local authority on things that they are not doing in terms of service delivery, unemployment, and corruption that is it's happening. And then, uh, out of that, uh, we started working in these five wards. And then when people realized that we were pushing very hard because in, in 2017, uh, immediately after we have uh, formed the civic organization, we, we challenged the, the local authority on the, on the corruption that was happening. Uh, for an example, we had about 70 million that were, Seven million that was in the savings account of the municipality. That amount of money just disappeared without a trace. Uh, we had people who are being employed without qualifications in the municipality. Uh, some of them they don't even have a grade twelve, even though the, the post that they are employed in it, it was demanding a diploma and uh, and degrees, but they were employed. Uh, without those kind of qualifications. So that's where uh, our poor service delivery comes from because those people have no idea as to what to do there. And the, 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 the state of the municipality is deteriorating as a result of those things that uh, of employing people who are underqualified for jobs. For example, we, 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 we have um, municipality buildings that uh, are occupied by ANC people who are not even working at the municipality. Uh, so that affects the, 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 the revenue collection of the municipality, uh, which result in poor service delivery. Uh, then we forced the then MEC of Cogtac, that is uh, Mr. Kasa, Figile Kasa, to come uh, and make an intervention in this municipality to further investigate uh, those allegations uh, against the municipality. And then indeed he came and uh, put the administrator, Mr. Mlokochi Vuyo. Then upon his uh, intervention, uh, Vuyo Mlokochi made some findings and uh, recommendations, even though uh, he had to to be given a bodyguard, about eight bodyguards, because 
the comrades were at loggerheads with him because they didn't want him to find out what was the main reason for the municipality to, to collapse uh, or go bankrupt. Because even the private companies were, some of the municipality assets were being auctioned because the municipality were, was owing some of the institution and being unable to pay those uh, debts. Uh, for example, one of the debts the municipality had was that of councillors who were enrolled at uh, Forte. Uh, and then the municipality owed an amount of 1.7 uh, at Forte for enrollment of councillors and accommodation of those councillors in, in BNBs and hotels uh, in East London. And then the, the, the administrator started to work and warned them that, uh, the, 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 the municipality is not supposed to enroll uh, these councillors in those institutions uh, and it is not in a state to finance those uh, 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 councillors to go to school. So they must stop that uh, initiative. And then even after he made those recommendations, the, the, the local authority continued to send the, the, the councillors to the varsity until, uh, until the debt raised to 2.4 million. Uh, and then the, 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 the administrator was only able to release a preliminary report because of the, the, the the, the comrades of the ANC were chasing him, uh, even trying to poison him in his office. Uh, so he was living in fear. Then out of that, the communities uh, decided that because of what Kora has done for the communities, uh, we during a lockdown level five, the Ikora managed to secure about uh, more than more than 6,000 food parcels across the community. Ours, we are only situated in a sub-region because we don't have enough resources to expand to the entire region. Because in this sub-region of Inokim Kijima, we have about 34 watts. Then we are only operating within those watts. Uh, and then we secured uh, more than 600 food parcels uh, towards the, 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 the region during the level five lockdown. And then uh, in, 20, in 2020, we managed to, to send to school about seven children who were unable to go to school because their families didn't afford the, the uniform, didn't afford... Uh... Hello? Yes. Uh, so we, we also managed to to visit all the factories that are around the Queenstown uh, to arrest the, the unemployment that uh, is increasing. Then we, we demanded those uh, factories to, to take the, the people from the local uh, communities because what was happening in those uh, factories before was that these councillors would go to, to rural areas to fetch their relatives to fetch their girlfriends to, to be employed in those uh, factories. Then we demanded to see their statistics of the people whom are employed there from the local uh, community. Then we find out that those uh, uh, numbers of, of the people who are coming from the local community were very low. Then we demanded that the number need to be increased from the local because those uh, Factories are supposed to, to benefit locals before they benefit people from far. And then we, we, we managed to, to get uh, employment for young people, more than 100 young people. We secured uh, permanent jobs for them in, the, in those factories. And then we, we are also busy with cleaning. Uh, illegal dumping site in our communities uh, without the help of the municipality. We approach uh, private businesses to help us with material because we are a civic organization that doesn't have funding. So we, 
we 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 roll on a handouts from those businesses uh, and then even in 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 fighting crime we also participate uh, in working in hand with the local police uh, just uh, last week we we, we had a uh, and two incidents in two different weeks whereby there was a buckling that happened in the community in my neighborhood then we were, the, the local uh, people came to report to us. Then we went to look for those things and then we discovered all the things that were, were taken. We, then we, we handed over those who were responsible for such to the police. Then from there, police proposed that we work with them hand in hand. So uh, last week, we also had a meeting with the, with the station commander. So, People uh, in our community meetings, they asked us if we should, uh, if we have uh, considered to, to contest local elections. And then they said, that is the only way they can get out of this crisis they, they find uh, themselves in. It's if we contest them, the, the local municipality uh, coming election. So that's where uh, they, they, hello? I was thinking of five minutes left. Oh, okay. Okay, no problem. Thank you. And then we took that position uh, from the ground uh, in our community meetings that we should contest local elections uh, uh, because uh, one of the things is that when we make these huge matches to the local authority, to the provincial authority to hand in a memorandum, it does not work because these people, they need to be pushed in a different angle, like uh, through judiciary. If you don't have money to take them to court, and then you can write as many petitions as you want. They won't do anything. They won't change anything. So we believe now, if we, 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 we take this position of contesting elections and then be able to, to have some, some funds to be able to, to push them to the to the court when necessary, then at least we, 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 we can make a difference because as it is now, we were able to take them last year to the high court in Markanda uh, through the, 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 the help of the local business people. So that is uh, how we, 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 we have reached the, the resolution of, of, of contesting local elections. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next we have our, our next speaker, Kazan Yansen of Gillen from Dr. Day Community Struggles. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Um, I will definitely try to shorten the context because if I run out of time before getting to the conclusion, the context won't make any sense to you. And also I'm going to refer to my notes because if I don't do that, um, I normally lose my train of thoughts and then my mind just goes all over the all all over the place. So, um, I actually just want to share some of of the observations um, that may contribute to kind of a formulation around a response regarding the strategy, form, and program um, with this from cap capitalist crisis to a left party. Um, so, I've um, just a little bit about myself. I've been working with unemployed and the working class people like the rural poor for about 17 years. And it's important for people to understand that the life of a poor person primarily revolves around a struggle for survival and, you know, a struggle for, for dignity. It's a day-to-day -day struggle for survival and, and dignity. 
um, because as we all know, after the 26 years of democracy, um, social economic rights in South Africa haven't been realized and people in power are deaf to the plight of the poor generally. So when it comes to the local municipality where I'm based and where I work, it's the Dr. Bayez Nodia municipality in the Sara Bartman district. I have countless stories about um, municipality and their failures and how they really just ignore people. Um, but, uh, you know, it might take very long. So I just want to like really jump into the organizing efforts and, and focus and reflect on the organizing efforts. Um, because I think when it comes to government and um, you know the dysfunctionality of government and that the ANC has failed us as a ruling party, we are kind of all on the same page. Um, but I have, I, I've summarized, um, all of these challenges that people are experiencing and the stuff that municipality does. Um, so I can share that with people just to fill in the context afterwards. Um, but um, time, time is, a, is an issue. Um, so for the purpose of this presentation, I want to focus on two particular sectors and their organizing efforts, our government has failed them. And then also obviously what they have done as a community um, to attempt to hold government accountable and um, to promote development in their own communities at grassroots level. Um, so the first sector will be the small scale farmers or the emerging farmers. And then the second will be the informal settlement dwellers. Um, I have to mention that the steps um, that Natalia referred to in her flow chart earlier, um, those steps are exactly the steps that we are following. Um, when we work with communities to, you know, raise awareness and, and attempt to organize communities. And it all works very, very well up until the point where it comes to the actual formation of a political party. Then for some or other reason, it just all goes south. Um, I, I'm not certain why. We are trying to interrogate that to see what exactly the problem might be, but we haven't come to a conclusion in that regard. So regarding the small scale farmers, I'm focusing on a very specific group of farmers in Willowmore, in the Bavions area, also in this municipality. They are very, very organized. They've established a very functional forum in about 2015 called the Bavions Land and Agrarian Reform Forum. Um, uh, maybe even earlier, I think it's almost a, a decade ago that they started working as a forum before they formalized themselves and, and registered as an NGO. Um, and in their efforts, they have... Um, They've, they've compiled their own integrated development plan, and they've been using that IDP to lobby for access to land and natural resources, um, basically ever since I can remember. Um, they, in particular, also have a very strong focus on environmental justice, and they've been primary um, role players in the establishment of the anti-fracking task team in 2012, and then subsequent to that, the Karoo Environmental Justice Movement, or KEJM, in 2016. Um, many of their local organizing and mobilizing strategies have proven to be very successful. Um, and they've managed to hold government accountable to some extent. Um, through their efforts, they have secured a lease agreement for 200 hectares of land for agricultural purposes. But then after they received the signed lease agreement from the, it, it was signed by the municipal manager, municipality just announced that they, they do not have the 200 hectare that was signed for in the lease agreement. Obviously that didn't sit well with the farmers, um, but they continued their efforts in, in holding government accountable. They met with municipality and agriculture on a regular basis and they just continue to put pressure on government to deliver what was promised in this lease agreement. Um, obviously to no avail, but, but I do think that if they continued on that path, they would have been successful at some point. 
But unfortunately, um, some of the members who are aligned to the EFF um, then kind of allowed party politics to interfere with their local organizing efforts. Um, so uh, these members aligned to the EFF, starting put, uh, they started putting political pressure on the municipality and threatened municipality with legal action. And obviously municipality then reverted to being all defensive and announced that they will measure out the 200 hectares in the mountains because then, according to them, they have adhered to the terms in the lease agreement, but we all know that that wouldn't make sense because you cannot like really farm in the mountains. Um, but then in the end, it um, on the 11th of March this month, there was a meeting between the farmers, the EFF and the municipality, and then magically this 200 hectare just appeared and it was handed over to the farmers after they said that they don't have the 200 hectares. So this all sounds wonderful, but now it appears as if this political interference has now given rise to other key, like really key concerns and challenges, because for one, the focus of many of these farmers has now shifted from production to politics. So they, they're not really concerned with actual farming anymore. It's more the pushing of the political agenda. So that whole, um, you know, uh, being in control of production and that whole food sovereignty concept now somehow got lost in all of this and all of their own plans are now put on hold. Um, they're, not, they're not really pursuing their own plans. So it's almost as if um, they allowed their own organization to be compromised to the benefit of the EFF, who doesn't necessarily share exactly the same vision that the farmers have for development and, and um, you know, um, particularly not the environmental agenda that they've been trying to push. Um, and of course, the EFF wants to now capitalize on the many small victories that the farmers had. Um, they're claiming the victories as their own. This created division in the community because these farmers, have, have, as I said, they were very successfully successful in mobilizing beyond farmers into the, into the community for environmental justice. But now there's this division of two camps, the DA and the EF, EFF camp. And it's as if the grassroots organization that had so much potential for bringing about the necessary change has now been totally destroyed in the Willowmore community. So this is just an example of how outside political party interference can destroy grassroots organization. And then I also have to mention that I've, I've experienced that formalizing community organization can have the very same effect. Um, I made mention of the Karoo Environmental Justice Movement. As a movement, we call them Kejam. They have been very successful in organizing communities in the Karoo against the fossil fuel companies and other um, environmentally destructive activities. And, um, but uh, it all fell flat when they attempted to formalize the movement and register it as a legal entity. So the movement has since collapsed. There's, there's basically nothing left of it because there was just too much conflict and different ideas of what it should like when it's formalized. Um, and that's like a huge loss that we experienced because of this formalization thing. Um, then regarding the informal settlements, I want to tell you quickly about Freigronde. Um, there's a lot I can but uh, tell you, but I've, I've summarized it. I will send it, uh, the context to people, but I have to just mention that um, it's an informal settlement with about 200 households here in Grafrinet. Um, they are crippled by socioeconomic rights violations. Um, that I've summarized, but I don't want to run out of time. So just in their efforts, I want to reflect on the efforts of organizing and how that turned out recently. So since 2019, we've been working with the community of Freigronde, um, very focused on local organizing and, and grassroots development. My time's up. What's that? 
five minutes left. Okay, so so you see, that's what I mean. If I don't get to the conclusion, the whole context doesn't mean anything. So I'll just skip all of that. Um, they they had a lot of um, you know uh, uh, demonstrations to to keep government accountable, and there's many positive things that they are engaging in, like the soup kitchen and the establishment of the hub with the support of COPAC, SCLIC and the Food Sovereignty Campaign. So they used to do great until the service delivery movement interfered there. So now the leadership have grown quiet. You don't hear their voices anymore. They've been driving all of these processes until the service delivery movement that also used to be a movement, but now turned out to be a political party until they interfered. And now these efforts are all just down the, down the tubes. So I'm not sure why organized communities are so willing to allow political parties to just take over what they've been working on for so long. And um, I'm also very unclear why organization efforts fall flat as soon as attempts are made to formalize it. Um, there's something that happens between the, the, the natural organized grassroots organization and the formal formalization of a structure that happens that make people lose interest or, or that just destroys the organization altogether. And I think we need to reflect on that and, and see, um, you know, in, in Natalia's flow chart, it all goes well up until the point where you actually formalize the political party and then nothing happens anymore. Um, I will send you the, the paper because I still wanted to reflect on the environmental, lack of environmental sensitivity of the service delivery movement and all. But I just think that, um, yeah, this won't end well because this community surrendered their power to, to the service delivery movement who do not share the same vision. And obviously, who claim their victories as their own, even the hub, the service delivery movement even claim the hub as their own victory. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And now we have our next speaker, Regina Hamilton. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. So I'm going to share about the climate justice charter movement approach to local government elections um, and i'm just going to start off with a very brief history about the climate justice charter and the movement for some of us for some of those of you who don't who haven't been following closely so the idea for a climate justice charter process and then later movement was born out of deliberations in the south african food sovereignty campaign at the end of 2018 However, many of the ideas and alternatives that are presented in the Charter have been brewing for the past seven years in the SAFC. In 2019, SAFC engaged different constituencies to give input into the climate justice ch Charter process. And then last year, the Charter was launched, was finalized and launched, and then presented to Parliament on the 16th of October, demanding that they adopt it as per section 234 of the Constitution. And so this year we will be going back to Parliament on the 16th of October, which is World Food Day, for Parliament's response. Um, but in the run up until then, we have put together a full phased mobilizing and campaigning approach um, and with the following objectives and aims. So firstly, to get the Charter, the climate science, the systemic alternatives presented in the Charter into the public discourse. Um, and this includes using local government elections as a moment for this to get endorsements for the charter from organizations and individuals, and then to build a mass-based climate justice charter movement. So as I said, there's four phases. The first phase involves deepening the roots of the charter to transform local and provincial government. So on the 22nd of April, uh, Earth Day, we are encourage, encouraging local actions across the country whereby activists will take the charter, the climate science document that we produced with scientists at WITS, um, the Food Sovereignty Act, and they local community demands to their local or provincial government. Um, and so some of the demands that, that we're encouraging activists and organizations to take to the, the, um, the local governments or the provincial governments is that climate science is taken seriously, 
that the Climate Justice Charter is adopted, that the People's Food Sovereignty Act is adopted to end hunger, that community deep just transitions um, demands for water, eco-housing, ending pollution, climate jobs, and more are supported, and that active steps are taken to end corruption now. And this will lead into phase two, which starts after the 22nd of April, which is about advancing deep just transitions in communities, workplaces, and local government, where we are developing a tool that people can use to translate the charter into policies in their workspaces, in the communities, and even in their local governments. And we'll workshop this tool and encourage institutions or communities to start developing climate justice policies. And these will also inform demands to parties and candidates, um, which are in the next phase. So phase three, we're calling that for climate justice local government elections. And here we will use the moment to demand climate justice local government elections, where we will construct a narrative telling parties that we will only vote for them if they meet our demands for climate justice. And these demands are similar to the ones on the 27th of April, but here we're saying that um, candidates, and party, ca candidates and parties must take climate science seriously. They must support the Climate Justice Charter and Food Sovereignty Act. They must support community deep just transition demands. And they must also be, have a clear commitment to end corruption. And so something else that we're going to do before elections is an assessment of the parties from the standpoint of the Climate Justice Charter. And we will also use the moment to raise the profile of the climate crisis and the climate justice charter alternatives. And then just to say what our fourth phase is, um, so that's about going to parliament where we'll call for an end to end hunger, for an end to hunger, thirst pollution and climate harm. And we'll call out South African, South African government for not being ambitious enough about the climate crisis, stating that net zero by 2050 is too late. And so through the, this four phase process, we are laying the basis to construct a narrative um, around the local government elections that is pro-climate pro justice. We're raising the profile of the climate crisis, the charter and its alternatives, um, including food sovereignty. And we're really focusing on building food sovereignty pathways throughout all of this. Um, and we're also building the people's climate justice charter movement. So in brief, that is our approach. Um, and as we go, and even after the 16th of October, we'll continue to reassess um, what our strategy is, um, and we'll continue to reflect. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay.